and I want to make sure that uh, that I clarify, we were not interested in killing this woman or any other uh, people's <laughs> children. <laughs> That's not that was that was not our motivation. And as far as we know, uh, no one died as a result of our our using uh, what we referred to as beet juice. are listening to Manager Brothers Lessons Learned. Twice each month, Greg and Jay Goodjo draw on their combined 80 plus years of state and local government work experience to help listeners avoid the pitfalls they and others have unwittingly stumbled into. And now, on to the episode. Well, Jay, do you remember when we were growing up and they used to spread road binder on the, you know, county would come along and spray road binder on, on 11th Street when we were when we were kids? Yeah, I mean, we basically the road was was dirt virtually the whole time we were growing up. They, they Gra- Gravel. Such, to be, to yeah. be fair, it was gravel. <laughs> well, they called it gravel, but I don't know if you could find a stone on there. It was all dirt, <laughs> I thought, you know, and then the way the, the, way the potholes and the ruts and everything, uh, soft spots in the spring developed, I, I didn't think there was much gravel left to it. And the way the dust flew when you drove <laughs> or anybody went up and down the road was just horrendous. So. I, and I don't, I, I was thinking about this, I don't know if people today have any appreciation for what it was like with older cars that are not built they were not built like the like they're built today and particularly they had a tendency to rust out so you would have oh, holes yes. in the floorboard and drive down these country roads these gravel roads and, and of course we're talking you know the 60s um, right so it's a while ago but you could be asphyxiated in that car with the amount of dust <laughs> that would come in there <laughs> you, could, you couldn't catch your breath i i distinctly remember that as a kid you know you had this layer of dust over everything in the you know on the seats on your clothes and in your lungs and whatever it was it was not pleasant well and it was even worse because you know dad always bought you know what i call it today a, a beater for a car to drive back and forth to work and that was the one that we you know were allowed to drive <laughs> to school events and things and i remember on one occasion heading down into kalamazoo down the big long hill there Going down that hill, we just absolutely, I can't remember if you were driving or I was driving, but anyway, we punched it as much as we could. I think we got up to 65 miles an hour or something going down that hill, <laughs> and the the engine was all greasy and oily and things, and that heated up sufficiently that it gave off a lot of smoke, and that <laughs> that filled the uh, passenger compartment, so you could, we had to roll the windows down. It must have been a sight going down the road with <laughs> smoke billowing out the windows, but, <laughs> you know, but anyway. Uh, yeah, you know, people. People uh, these days, you know, they drive all these newer cars, and even the old used cars are better conditioned than anything that uh, that we had available back oh. in those days. You know, yes. It, it, yes. you know, if you got if you had. Uh, you know, seventy-five thousand miles in a car, it was ready for the junkyard. <laughs> they're exactly. just, they're, they're, today, you know, that's nothing. They were barely yep. getting broken in. But yep. you know, yep. the so all these dirt, you know, these gravel roads, and the one in front of our house, they would come along, as I remember, in the spring or early summer, and spray this road binder. Do you remember the odor off from that? That was awful, and I, I always wondered if other counties did use the same product or not, or if it was just, you know, our Allegan County, because we had paper mills and what road binder was was paper mill waste so and, and see you know um, it's funny it's funny you should say that because i remember hearing that and i and i you know i thought back i said is that true how did we know that was the case i you know i i remember knowing that or having heard that i thought maybe it was just a rumor because the you know whatever product they were using had an odor that was kind of reminiscent of what you would get off from the nearby paper mill it wasn't it wasn't the paper mill uh, uh, in Plainwell, where we grew up, it was an adjacent community's paper right. mill. I won't mention them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when you drove by their uh, settling ponds, I guess is what they were, it was this brown goo spraying up in the air, yeah. you know, to aerate it. And that had the exact odor of the road binder. Yeah. So I'm, I think that's, you know, maybe a little bit 
stronger than an assumption. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you and I both remember the same thing, so we both remember it wrongly. If it's if that's the case, uh, yes. you know. So we I should try- apologize for everybody that worked at a vapor mill. I guess yeah, that's, so. that's exactly right. You know, we we might just have learned something or assumed something when we were kids. And I know I I did a little bit of research online, and I think in the old days there was some kind of per- petroleum based product that was used as a road binder. And what it would do is to bind these. Uh, you know, these particles of dirt, sand, and and gravel together so that they would form kind of a hard crust on the on the surface of the road and it would last typically a season and then you know you go through the winter and get into the next uh, summer and it was back to being the same condition it was and they'd have to come along and do it and uh, but if, you know the road would be you know have kind of a wet covering to it, coat to it um, for a few days, and then it would tend to harden up and and uh, it had this dark uh, color, uh, reddish brown, if I remember uh, to it, right, uh, right. that kind of thing. So well, the reason that I bring this up, uh, w- w- what I wanted to talk about today was my experience with learning that uh, sometimes you need to test things before you, uh, before you decide you're going to use them. When uh, I was working in a community, and of the 80 miles, linear miles of roads that we, streets we had in that community, about 10% of them, eight miles of them, were still, uh, still gravel roads. Uh, and these were in neighborhoods all around, uh, all around the community. We didn't use that road binder product. We were using a liquid calcium chloride as the dust control product. And it did about the same thing. So every spring, you know, we would uh, let a contract and a vendor would come in and spray the roads. And, uh, and that would keep the dust down in those neighborhoods the, the dust is really an annoyance in the you know in the springtime in the summertime you've got your windows open and it's going to blow in the house and if you're one of these uh, people who hangs laundry out on the line you're going to get it all over the all over the clothes and so yeah, it was just one of those things that it was a part of the service that we provided through the public works department to go and and do that Well, my public works director came to me one day and he said, there is a vendor who has approached us with a product that is less expensive than calcium chloride, and it is made from kind of a byproduct of sugar beet processing. And uh, there's a lot of sugar beet processing that goes on in Michigan. And uh, Jay, I I assume you remember from when you lived up in the Thumb area to see these mountains of sugar beets that, you know, (laughs) would would get piled up in various communities where uh, the farmers would bring their products in to be processed. I remember seeing that. Yeah, I remember seeing that. That's a a sight to behold uh, at harvest time to go up and see these huge piles of these big sugar beets that uh, you know are waiting to be turned into something we can buy at the store since the county i worked in was as flat as a board you know those were the highest points in the county when they were <laughs> harvesting sugar beets you know that was there was just mounds of them and when you talk about the odors and maybe uh, at least i have an excuse when when i share my part of the story but uh, there was there was a, a processing plant uh, in the county a smaller one and so i got used to that odor of sugar beets being processed and some of the byproducts and things like that that you, you'll be talking about here with this yeah. uh, with this product. Yeah. So DPW Cup director comes in and he says, you know, they've got this product indicate it works really well. Uh, it will be less expensive for us than using calcium chloride. So I said, go check it out. And he did. He went and he saw where it had been applied. I think if I remember correctly, it was in maybe a landfill area or some other kind of industrial kind of area where they needed to have some dust control. And so he had gone and seen where this had been used and, and said, this stuff really seems to work well it does good job in keeping the dust down it hardens up the the road really nicely so it provides a nice driving surface and so we said all right it's less expensive it works let's give this a try so what we did was to spray it on all eight miles of gravel streets that we had uh, in the city and this stuff worked just as advertised it kept the dust down it it uh, put this uh, you know this hard surface where it bound all those uh, all those stray particles together Together, it was great for a week and oh. then and then at the end of that week we started to get odor complaints uh, what we had failed to take into consideration that this by- byproduct of sugar beet processing is still an organic product and it is subject to decomposition <laughs> and so what we were getting was the smell of rotten 
sugar beet waste or whatever it was. And and needless to say, uh, we had people that were a little unhappy with the amount of uh, odor that we had caused to be brought in <laughs> brought into their neighborhood. We uh, we had uh, a woman show up at a council meeting, and she brought along a, a mason jar that she had filled with this kind of brownish liquid that she had uh, that she had dipped out of uh, you know out of a pothole and uh, or mud puddle in front in front of her house, and uh, she offered to pass it around to the council members. I think they all declined, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, but I'll never forget she stood up there and and accused the staff of trying to kill her children with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, my my experience with the same product uh, was a little bit a little bit different in the community I was uh, working, and this was the uh, during the winter of 2012-2013, and I don't know if you remember um, that particular time, but uh, the the Great Lakes were kind of at a low point volume wise, and so how that impacted. Uh, communities was that uh, shipments of uh, the road salt for winter use um, they would come into the port in Muskegon, but because of uh, the low water levels and silting and, and what have you that naturally occurs in some of the harbors, um, they could not get some of the ships in uh, without dredging. And so there was a lot of discussion going on about dredging. Well, the way that impacted that that particular winter, um, the state of Michigan uh, was getting, you know, which basically most many of the many of the municipalities con, you know, are on the state contract for the for the road salt. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't get shipments in from I think it was Kansas is where the salt was coming from. And I'm not sure, you know, how you get a ship from Kansas to Muskegon because I don't think there's a I don't think there's a single <laughs> there's waterway. No, yeah, there's no direct it, waterways. That's I don't think sure. I'm not sure there's any water in Kansas. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how you get from a, sh a ship of that size <laughs> into Kansas in the first place. But anyway, then to get up into uh, Lake Michigan, as it were. But so everybody was scrambling to get their. You, you couldn't even get, in some cases, you couldn't even get your allocation of, of road salt because uh, the state of Michigan had, had cut back on, uh, you know, what they were going to allow, you know, communities to use. Mm -hmm. And as a, a near near lakeshore community, you know, concerned with uh, lake effect snow, you want to make sure you have an abundant, you know, supply of road salt. So, right, right. So everybody was looking to find other sources of, of salt uh, at a reasonable you know, price, contracted price. And in, I think in some cases, the alternative was uh, about double uh, the price, which really, really wreaks havoc on your, on your budget for, you know, for winter uh, road maintenance. So the same, probably the same uh, sales rep contacted us and said, hey, I have this product and you can you can spray it in and mix it in with your with your road salt and it will reduce the amount of road salt that's necessary because instead of washing off you know the roads when you get um, snow or, or you know freezing rain and what have you it, it tends to stick so we I think we were looking at about you know maybe a 30 percent uh, savings mm -hmm. you know, cost wise you know on it so you know we we placed an initial uh, order i can't remember what the quantity was but it obviously it was liquid in a in a container and and we had you know early in the winter we had a lot of freezing rain uh, situations so this was used um more so at intersections and, mm -hmm. and what have you in the in the community and worked really well i mean it stuck around uh, literally stuck uh, to the pavement and um, you could you could put it on preemptively so uh, the freezing rain the, the wouldn't freeze in in those locations. So it was actually a safety element as well as a cost saving thing. But yeah. uh, uh, the village president didn't like the odor and yeah. so uh, directed me and and convinced council that we were never going to buy this product again. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, not not to do that. So you know, so well, well, um, and it, you know that's a. That's an interesting, you know, an interesting reaction. Now, if you're getting odor complaints in the wintertime, yes. <laughs> imagine, imagine what the odor complaints are going to be in the summertime when people actually have their windows open and they're outside trying to, you know, barbecue in the backyard and those kinds of things. So, right, you know, right. 
Well, and like I said, I was kind of desensitized <laughs> to the odor from my previous experience sure. where I where I worked up in the thumb area. You know, it just I well, it's just you know seemed like a kind of a sweet smell to me and oh yeah and uh, it would it would go away after you had you know sufficient rain and things like that yeah. but uh, yeah and uh, that was that was our experience as well it didn't hang around for a while uh but it's it certainly wasn't an experience that we wanted to repeat again it, I, I, and i want to go back and, and i want to make sure that uh, that i clarify we were not interested in killing this woman or any other uh, people's <laughs> children <laughs> that's not that was that was not our motivation and as far as we know uh, no one died as a result of our, our using uh, what we referred to as beet juice. Uh, I don't know what the actual name of the product was now. Uh, and and it, 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 one thing that is interesting is that, you know, the, the reaction of your uh, you know, uh, your, your council members to this uh, was different. Uh, what, my DPW director at the meeting where this woman showed up uh, went up to one of the council members afterwards and, you know, was, he was a little sheepish about it and, and said to the council member, well, you know, uh, we tried. Uh, meaning we tried to find a lower cost product that would be just as effective. So we tried and he said, keep trying. And so it was really, uh, you know, there was a willingness on their part to recognize, you know, not every experiment that you undertake uh, is, uh, is going to be successful, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. Well, exa exactly. And I, I thought in my case, you know, we were looking at cost savings, availability um, and, and effectiveness, you know, for safety reasons. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, here's there's three three good points right there. Well, those all quickly evaporated. <laughs> we'll return to Manager Brothers Lessons Learned in a moment. Do you have a topic you would like Greg and Jay to explore? Are you interested in being a guest on Lessons Learned? Do you have comments about this episode? You can write Greg and Jay using the contact form at gregllc.com slash lessons. That's G-R-E-G-G-L-L-C dot com slash lessons. So a year goes by, this same vendor comes back to the DPW director and says, you know, are you interested in us doing this, our doing this another year? <laughs> to which the uh, director said, absolutely not. And here's the reason why. And the, the sales rep said, look, we've made some changes to this process to try and address that particular problem. So, uh, you know, we think we've, we've, uh, we've got that problem licked. And so the DBW director comes, reports this to me, and I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We'll give this a try on one street, and we had a gravel, uh, gravel road in, adjacent to one of our parks. And I said, there's nobody that lives around it. It's all park land, not going to cause any problems if, anybody, if there's any odor. So we did. We sprayed it just on this one section of road and discovered that the odor problem was just the way it was before. <laughs> they, there was no difference after a week we began to get older and and so we uh, we decided that uh, we weren't going to do that but here's here's the valuable lesson for uh, for that came from that you know you have something new uh, you know we think that you know you do all your research you do your due diligence you look and see you think you know everything there is to know about it but there may be something you hadn't thought about and that's where doing a test run uh, using a small sample to you know to, to determine is this idea going to work before we roll it out wholesale uh, to everybody in town I think is when the opportunity presents itself is something that's that's definitely worth worth pursuing it's something we don't oftentimes i think think to do uh when we're you know when we've got a new initiative and that is you know let's test it let's check it out let's give it a give it a a, a, a trial uh before we decide that we're sold on this well and, and i think the other thing you know i guess the other perspective on this is as managers you know we obviously look at cost effective and you know the effectiveness of products and things you know um Kind of routinely, so mm -hmm. you're you're looking at ways to to save your municipality uh, money and and what have you, and there are instances where you may may have a product that you don't have an alternative, you know, but to purchase that for a particular use, and it may have some 
you know, <laughs> some side effects such as odor or what have you. And I'm thinking uh, in, in, in another instance, a, a community that I worked in, um, we had an issue with a uh, resident uh, who bought a home that somebody had planted bamboo um, in the yard. And bamboo is an inv invasive species mm -hmm. and very, very difficult to uh, contain, first of all, and very, very, even extremely more difficult to eradicate. And uh, she was just at wit's end because it had not only taken over her yard, but now was spreading into neighbors' yards and what have you. So she mm -hmm. came to the municipality and asked if, if there was anything we could do to uh, help eradicate that. So uh, what they ended up doing was using a herbicide uh, that is extremely controlled. I mean, it has to, it's only available to uh, farmers and units of government or whatever. So it's, you can't buy it off the, the store shelf or whatever. Um, and uh, so our uh, DPW went in and eradicated the bamboo everywhere and then resident had to pay for that of course it wasn't done as a as a freebie or anything like that sure um so you had to buy you know this in a quantity of you know 55 gallons or whatever so it was interesting i didn't it, you know i didn't appreciate i guess you know what what was involved in this chemical but um i had noticed that there was a patch of poison ivy out kind of a, a side door to the city office there and you know, where staff would go out and some you know, that still smoked used that during their breaks but other people during decent weather would go out and sit at a picnic table and i said you know there's a i'm you know of course allergic to poison ivy so i just mm -hmm. made mention to the dbw can we get rid of that poison ivy well they came over with that same chemical and sprayed that you know and i didn't give a thought to it um it did have an odor but i didn't go out the, the back door or side door uh, that frequently. Yeah. Um, but uh, a few days later, we got phone calls from some people that lived in the condos about two blocks away <laughs> complaining of this odor, <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, so we had to be a little bit more uh, – cautious about you know how it, how it was used because maybe there was a, another less obnoxious uh, herbicide that would have been yeah. okay for the poison ivy but obviously uh, wouldn't have worked as effectively on the uh, and the bamboo uh, uh, project so yeah, yeah so it, there's so there's things that you just you know you don't give a thought to but yeah you might have to look at, at where where you're going to use this well and again that's you know i think this is a good example where you know if you're using that same herbicide say in an agriculture cultural setting where, you know, you're removed from, you know, nearby residents by quite a distance, you know, any odor is not going to be not going to be that big of an issue. Uh, there are those uh, unforeseen aspects of something that uh, we ought to kind of keep in the back of our mind. What what could go wrong here? Uh, the other the other thing that I was thinking of is we've been been talking to, you know, you and I grew up in, in a rural area. So you're used to certain odors in those rural areas. You know, you don't give a thought to that. And, uh, you mean when, like when, like like farmers spreading manure, for example? Well, this is where I was <laughs> this is where I was headed because uh, when I was when I my first uh, my first job with state government, uh, working in a very rural area up in the Thumb area, large large agricultural operations anyway, and just to the east of of the community was a really large hog farm, and they had tanks or whatever that they. Uh, mostly in the winter time they would collect collect the uh waste material from from the hogs you know and, and it would be in a liquid form and it would uh, decay or ferment or whatever it was doing in those tanks and then in the spring uh when it was when they could get out in the fields they would they would spread that mm -hmm. anyway and it was never an issue because most of the time the prevailing winds were from the west you know yeah but i could remember a couple of times the wind the, the wind shifted and came from the east for a day or two and it was like man it, did i even need to bathe today because it's <laughs> all so bad in the office that nobody would have any, would even have noticed you know but it was <laughs> it was it was pretty potent stuff and you know people would complain you know in general but what are you going to do about it you know there's certain things like that that in context you know we we got used to things living in a rural area uh, managers that came from uh, metropolitan areas wouldn't have experienced any of these things perhaps yeah yeah so. no question about it well getting back to uh, my gravel 
my gravel roads, uh, gravel streets in this community. Uh, one of the so we went back to you know using calcium chloride, but maintaining gravel streets is expensive. You have to grade them, you have to do this uh, dust control on them. They're no fun to have, um, and so but. We didn't have the funds, uh, and because we used special assessments as a part of our street reconstruction efforts, uh, the public uh, who lived on those streets was never inclined to come and petition to have them improved because they, uh, you know, they they didn't want to have to pay the their share of the cost of putting in curb and gutter and paving and all the rest of it. And it hit on me one day that maybe there was another alternative. Uh, the I noticed that the county road commission would use chip and seal to, you know, uh, on various roads. And so I said to the city engineer, what would happen if we were to, to do some layers of chip and seal on gravel streets? Would that hold up? And he said, you know, there might be some merit to that. So <laughs> learning my lesson from uh, what we had uh, done uh, with, uh, with using beet juice for dust control, I said, all right, let's find one street. We'll try a triple chip and seal on the street to provide a more permanent hard surface and see how it performs before we decide we want to promote this around the community. And so we had, we had a street that was located adjacent to a city park. There were a couple of residents along it. Uh, it was a really good challenge because it was on a hill. Uh, so it wasn't the easiest, you know, tended to get that washboard that you get on, on gravel uh, roads on hills. Uh, it was a tough, tough road all the way around, and it was going to be a really good test to see whether this would work. As it turns out, it worked just as we expected that it would, and we did, in fact, then have the ability to roll that out around town, and anybody that questioned whether or not this was a prudent course of action, uh, would ha we could point them to the one that we had already done. And the residents actually ended up being very happy with it. I remember we were able to do that. The, the We actually assessed the entire cost of that against the, uh, the property owners for the initial application of it at uh, $5 a front foot. So it was very, very inexpensive for them, but completely eliminated our need to uh, grade those roads and to you know, after they were initially done, and also certainly didn't need to use dust control on them. And, you know, every few years we had to go and apply another couple of layers of chip and seal on them to keep them up. Uh, my, the, some of those roads did later get improved with, uh, with curb and gutter, I think, but, uh, but there, my, my suspicion is that some of those, some of those roads, they might still be using that, that same thing. But the, the message here and the, the point is, looking for ways in which you can test out some of our brilliant ideas helps you to avoid what I refer to as uh, one of the thinking errors, which is to be too clever by half. Uh, right. You know, and that's that's a danger I think that smart people fall into is we think we've got it all figured out and don't always anticipate everything we ought to anticipate. Yeah, of course, just a little uh, sidebar comment on your on your chip and seal uh, as a motorcycle rider. <laughs> we hate those <laughs> roads because it's like riding on marbles. I'll tell you, it's 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 bad. I try to avoid them whenever possible. But, well, uh, I can I can understand that. We we did not consider the motorcyclists when we were. <laughs> not, so you didn't not, al you didn't allow any in town per, apparently. <laughs> uh, not on those streets. <laughs> I don't think we had signs. They must have figured it out all on their own. But. That's, that's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that uh, pretty well covers that topic. We're uh, getting to the end of, an, of a half an hour here, uh, yes. which is what we're trying to keep these roads at. Uh, these roads. These episodes at. I'm, you know, I've got my mind fixed on one thing here. I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't decided what we're going to be talking about again in a couple of weeks, but uh, we'll we'll come up with something. But yes. uh, and we've got, and Jay, we've got to come up with a clever way to end these programs. I, I haven't figured out what they <laughs> what that is. But you know, just saying goodbye. And I think many people probably have figured out that we are not in the same location when we do this. I'm in my house and you're in your house uh, across the, you know, uh, uh, 50 miles away or whatever it is. So uh, uh, we, we, we uh, stilted conversation that goes on here, especially when we get to the point of signing off. So uh, we're, we're going to have to maybe we'll have a contest and uh, people can uh, can come up with ways to, to you know, that uh, we ought to end the show. I, I originally want to end it. Want to end it by uh, copying the you know the click and clack the tappet brothers and say uh, don't manage like my brother uh, but, <laughs> but well but, we're supposed uh, to we're, we're supposed to have some fake advertisers or whatever that we mentioned at the end i think so <laughs> anyway <laughs> well well 
we, we, we might have to, we might, you know, we'll work on that. Maybe uh, we'll have to come up with our own way of, uh, our own way of concluding these to, uh, but, uh, but until then, I guess the best way to say is uh, I'll see you the next time. I guess. I mean, I, I was going to mention there was a, there was a radio station in the metropolitan area that had uh, a fake advertiser, fake sponsors, I guess you want to say. And one of them was a, was a, a men's uh, a cl- a clothing store. And they would always say, you know, all our pants are half off. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we're, we can't use that one, but we'll, we'll come up with something uh, equally clever, perhaps. All right. That's, so. our, that's, our, that's our challenge for the next time, uh, is, right. to, is to think, think of uh, some way we can, uh, we can better end these episodes. Yes, I agree. All right. All right. Take, Take care. care. Thank you for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the show. Manager Brothers Lessons Learned is a production of Greg Guidance, LLC, a multi-specialty consulting firm offering interim management, group process facilitation, workflow analysis, operational studies, and more to local governments in Michigan and